The Saint Jacinta campaign is well known in Texas history as the concluding military event of the Texas Revolution. Its significance was that it helped establish the independence of Texas and the creation of the Republic of Texas. The, the battle itself was, was not a very large battle. It did not involve a very a large amount of, of men uh, in comparison with, say, Civil War battles or other battles of world history. But measured by its results and also by the notoriety that it achieved in Texas, it is certainly one of the most significant battles in world history. And it is a testament to the soldiers who fought at that battle that Texans have continued to celebrate that day, St. Jacinta Day, as a major holiday for the last 166 years. And I think by uh, just seeing how many people have come here today is indicative of the fact that that battle and the events surrounding that battle still capture the imagination of Texans, uh, and we still continue to discuss it, debate it, and analyze it today, and I'm sure that uh, our, answer, our, our descendants 100 years from now will continue to, to do the same. <clears throat> The battle itself, the Saint Jacinta campaign, is, is defined roughly as the period following the fall of the Alamo on March 6, up through and including the battle on April 21st, and the Mexican retreat from Texas, uh, which was completed in May of 1836. During this period, we have many dramatic events occurring. We have the government of Texas being established at Washington on the Brazos, the deliberations for the creation of a functioning government, a constitution, a, a Texan cabinet, and a, and a leadership in a, in a military role. We have Sam Houston taking command of the Texas Army uh, and giving the authority to take command literally just a few days before he arrives at Gonzales. And he is, he is uh, faced immediately with the situation of receiving news that the Alamo has fallen, the Mexican Army is coming, he has less than 400 men available uh, who are all volunteers, he has to figure out a way to organize those men into an army and defend the Texan settlements. Meanwhile, during this campaign, you have Colonel James Fannin at Goliad uh, attempting to defend that place uh, and under orders to rendezvous with Sam Houston on the Colorado River. We see the famous retreat of Sam Houston from the Guadalupe River to the Colorado River, where he intends initially to make his stand. But after Sam Houston finds out that Fannin has been cut off and, and uh, surrenders to Jose Urea, Houston continues his retreat to the Brazos. He, he arrives at San Felipe de Austin, which is, uh, which is near uh, Interstate 10 and the Brazos River crossing today, uh, leaves Mosley Baker's company across the river, Wally Martin's company down by President Richmond to guard that crossing, and Houston's army moves up north adjacent to present-day Hempstead, which at that time was across from Jared Grossi's plantation. And there he sits and waits for the Mexican army to come forward. Uh, Santa Ana himself is at the head of the army, arrives at San Felipe, but moves south to present-day Richmond. And there he learns that, te that the Texan cabinet at Harrisburg is, ex is an ex in, an, in an exposed position. So with that opportunity in front of him, Santa Ana crosses over and tries to capture the Texan cabinet which is totally undefended. Uh, in one of the great dramatic moments of this campaign, the cabinet manages to evacuate Harrisburg literally hours before Santa Ana arrives. Uh, Santa Ana is frustrated. He gets to, he gets to Harrisburg, uh, sends his, his uh, cavalry under Colonel Juan Almonte to try to capture the cabinet. Uh, they arrive at the beach at New Washington, which is now Morgan's Point, Texas, <clears throat> and literally President Burnett uh, literally escapes uh, being shot at by only a matter of a few feet, having rowed off from the, from the edge of the shore uh, with his wife and, and, uh, and children in, in the same boat with him. And he makes it safely down to Galveston. Uh, meanwhile, Santa Ana decides to go over to New Washington to secure the supplies that Almonte captured. And there he meets up with several Texan colonists who tell him, don't worry, you've already won this war. Sam Houston is in full retreat to the Trinity River. But the reality is, is that Houston's army was crossing the Brazos River, and they were heading toward Harrisburg. And what they did was they arrived opposite Harrisburg on Buffalo Bayou on the morning of, eight, of April 18th. They saw that Santa Ana had burned the town of Harrisburg. Def Smith and his Texan spy company went out, captured a Mexican courier and a spy and a guide, 
<clears throat> and the news that they brought back was that Santa Ana had divided his forces. He was with a smaller group at New Washington, was heading toward San Jacinto, the crossing at San Jacinto River at Lynch's Ferry. And it was with this news on April 19th that Sam Houston, together with Tom Rusk and others, decided that they would go ahead and cross Buffalo Bayou and try to intercept Santa Ana. They did so after gathering the men together, giving them a very dramatic speech where Houston told the men to, that they were about to meet Santa Ana and to remember the Alamo in the process of doing so. So April 19th was spent crossing the river. The Texas Army arrives uh, opposite Lynch's Ferry on the morning of the 20th, uh, several hours before Santa Ana's army comes up. And there we have both armies facing each other on the morning of April 20th. Uh, during that day, we, we had several engagements, relatively minor cannonades with each other. Uh, there was a, a cavalry skirmish late in the day. <clears throat> but it was the morning of April 21st, which by the way happened to be a Thursday, uh, that the action really got started. It was, that, it was the morning of April 21st when General Koss reinforced Santa Ana, having arrived through, coming through Harrisburg, uh, going through present day Pasadena, crossing Vince's Bridge over Vince's Bio, and giving Santa Ana a numerical advantage over Sam Houston's army. As a result of that, Houston sent out Def Smith to destroy Vince's Bridge, and plans were immediately made to decide what to do at this point. Uh, around noon, there was a council of war. Uh, the officers decided to, uh, that the most prudent thing to do would be to wait for an attack as opposed to attacking Santa Ana's army. Uh, Sam Houston didn't comment on that result. Uh, but later in the day, the situation changed. Sam Houston felt confident that his men could fight, that they wanted to fight. And so it was at 3 o'clock, approximately 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that the men lined up at his orders, marched across the field in double file formation, wheeled around and under, under a barrage of, of gunfire from the Mexican lines, continued forward and attacked at the battles and became the Battle of San Jacinto, which lasted for about 18 minutes. Let's see here. Now, I'm gonna conclude my remarks by uh, reading an account of the battle by Colonel John M. Swisher, who was in the Army. I think, as opposed to summarizing exactly what happened myself, I think he gives a very good, uh, succinct description of what happened that day. He says that the morning of the 21st of April, 1836, dawned bright and beautiful. It appears to have been the impression of General Houston and a large majority of his officers that if we remained quiet, Santa Ana would attack us in our encampment as our camp was almost impregnable. A general council of war decided almost unanimously that it was better to await the attack. Consequently, the greater portion of the day was spent in inactivity to the great disgust of some few hotheads and would-be great men who had condemned General Houston for not fighting at the Colorado. And we'll probably hear more about this in our discussions today. About 10 o'clock, General Koss, at the head of 500 men, reinforced Santa Ana, but no attack was made. On the other hand, they were still busily engaged, fortifying their encampment. As soon as General Houston was advised of this fact, the army was paraded, and about 3.30, we were ordered to the attack. The troops marched with alacrity to a distance of about a quarter of a mile from the Mexican encampment, where we were formed in line of battle and ordered to charge, having reserved our fire to within point-blank range. Thick and fast flew the bullets. In less than 20 minutes from the time we commenced firing, we were in possession of the enemy's breastworks with all their camp equipment and baggage. And before the sun sank on the western horizon, 630 Mexicans had been killed, 208 wounded, 730 taken prisoners. The Texan loss was eight killed and 28 wounded. The Battle of San Jacinto was one of the most remarkable battles in the world's history. <clears throat> it will not do to say that the Mexicans were cowardly and would not fight. They fought long and well. They commenced firing upon us at the distance of 400 yards and kept it up incessantly until we had scaled their breastworks. Many of them stood and battled until their brains were dashed out with club guns. Their bodies lay thick around their artillery. The man with the fuse was shot in the act of applying it. And the cannon was captured loaded. During the charge, the air seemed to be full of hissing bullets. Many of them passed over head. Many struck the ground in front 
and many flitted by the ears of the soldiers, almost scorching them. It really seemed as if some invisible hand had turned them aside. The God of battles fought with Joshua. Why may he not have fought with Sam Houston? <laughs> on the day after the battle, in the afternoon, I happened to be on duty guarding the captured baggage and prisoners when a party of several horsemen passed within a few feet of where I was posted. I noticed a commotion among the prisoners. Many of them rose to their feet and in a distinct voice said, Santa Ana, Santa Ana, el Presidente. This was the first intimation that anyone had that the captive was being brought into camp was a man of such distinguished note. When captured, he was disguised in a blue cottonade round jacket and pants and claimed to be a private soldier. But upon his captor, pointing to his fine shirt and studs, he professed to be a colonel in the army and desired to be taken to General Houston. However, nothing was known in regard to his rank until he was identified by the Mexican prisoners. <clears throat> he was immediately taken to General Houston's quarters and although several persons were present, he seemed to identify the general instantly and addressed him in a firm, slow voice. Many versions have been given of the speech, none of them, however, differing materially. The translation I heard in camp at the time, I recollect distinctly, and it is as follows. I am Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, President of the Republic of Mexico and General in Chief of the Army of Operations against Texas. I surrender to the brave who are always just. With that, I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about our symposium format today. Each speaker will have about 30 to 40 minutes, and this will be followed by a brief question and answer period. We have microphones on my right and on my left. <clears throat> I would ask that if you have a question, please stand in front of the microphone. <clears throat> this is uh, not a debate. Uh, each, you're certainly welcome to ask hard questions uh, after each speaker speaks. And uh, of course, we all know, given the audience here, that uh, we Texans take our history uh, very seriously and passionately. Uh, but uh, one rule today has to be that our questions have to be civil. And if our questions become uncivil, uh, Mrs. Powell in the back will turn off your microphone. <laughs> our first speaker is Jim Haley. Jim grew up in Fort Worth, and he currently lives in Austin. He graduated summa cum laude from the University of Texas at Arlington with a degree in political science. Jim has been a published author since the age of 19. His first history book on the Red River War of 1874-75 was published in 1976 and is now being translated into Italian, which I find interesting. He has also written many novels, but he is here today because he has just published through the University of Oklahoma Press the largest and most complete biography ever written about Sam Houston. Our theme today is personalities of San Jacinto. And when you think of the, the leaders and the personalities that affected this battle, this event in Texas history, certainly Sam Houston it plays the dominant role. Jim Haley uh, is, uh, uh, much, much to Jim Haley's uh, publisher's chagrin, it took him almost 15 years to complete this book. Uh, but, it, but is an outstanding uh, summary of Sam Houston's life. He relied on many new materials, and he's currently touring the state promoting his book. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jim Haley, whose talk will be on Sam Houston and San Jacinto. It wasn't supposed to happen this way. Thank you, Jeff. I suppose my first duty today is to say that uh, uh, after nonstop book touring for six weeks uh, in perfect health, I am just now getting over a siege of, I think, every known cold, croup, laryngitis, sinus infection known to the human species. And I must warn you that there will be a few times during this presentation when I, when I will probably have to stop and make some kind of really unappetizing biological noise. And I, I beg you to remember that we're all God's children. And uh, when your squamous epithelial cells are messed up, there's one and only one way uh, to fix it. Now, I had hoped that perhaps like uh, Strether Martin and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, I could uh, maybe find some way to sort of use the expectoration as a kind of humorous punctuation to my talk. But considering that you know, a large part of it is going to be about uh, differing interpretations of history, 
if I were to hack and spit every time I said the word revisionist, it might be taken way the wrong way. <laughs> I, I am really honored to be here today in such distinguished company. Uh, symposia such as this do so much to uh, serve the craft of history, the exchange of ideas, uh, and the comparison of gathered information uh, helps so much in the progress of understanding the past. When I got to the hotel yesterday, a uh, thing that I would sort of put all my notes together and organize and calm myself and all this, I walked right into a nod of Jack Jackson and Ron Tyler and Jim Crisp and you know, some other people, and I just instantly sat there like a student and started learning. I mean, just the idea of bringing people together like this uh, is, is such a wonderful pollination uh, of ideas. In fact, it's really sort of an acceleration of what I've already been discovering while on the book tour. Uh, because it, I've probably been to, I, I don't know, 25 different cities so far. Uh, descendants come up to me, people who knew Houston, people who worked with Houston, and everybody has uh, their, their own sort of family memory. And it's a very interesting because you don't get that uh, sort of family tradition of uh, my great-great-grandfather met Burnett or Sherman or even Austin, and I love Austin to death. He was just tired. You know, nobody carried that voltage that Sam Houston did. Uh, and just a, a few nights ago, I was in New Braunfels, and uh, I met the great-great-granddaughter of San Jacinto veteran Jesse McCrocklin, and she shared her little memory uh, with me, which was that uh, before Sam Houston reformed and stopped drinking, he would visit McCrocklin, and they would sit on McCrocklin's front porch drinking and smoking tobacco, or chewing tobacco. And as uh, this new informant said, I, I remember my grandmother always saying, People can praise Sam Houston all they want to, but I never will. I had to clean up after him. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. People have the idea that you write a book to tell people what happened, and that's true, but only to a certain point, because what happens is you publish the book and put it out there, and then people come out of the woods to tell you things that you would have killed to know before. Uh, I think he won't mind me sharing this story, but a couple of weeks ago I got an email from uh, longtime former Lieutenant Governor Bill Hobby. Now, uh, Bill Hobby, of course, as you know, is, is um, oh, I don't, I, I don't know how, but he was sort of a late in life baby. And if you remember, his father was governor of Texas during World War I. So when Bill Hobby, and he's a, a, an incredibly knowledgeable Texas history and, and Sam Houston buff, but when he starts talking about the past, he takes big steps. <laughs> and um, he said that he remembered his father, Will Sr., uh, said once that he knew an old newspaper man in his day who had been present during Sam Houston's last illness. And he related the story, and I had never heard it before, that, uh, of course, everybody knew that Houston was very ill. And there were friendly newspapers to him, but not many. Most of the newspapers in Texas were very hostile to him. Uh, but there were newspaper editors who went to Huntsville and were sort of milling around the front yard of the steamboat house because they knew that when he passed away, it would be a big story. <laughs> and uh, now, if you rem remember, Sam Houston took a lot of trouble during his last months to sort of make peace with old enemies. He didn't want to leave loose ends and hard feelings behind, and most people knew this. But there were a couple of these uh, hostile newspaper editors who were just sort of milling around waiting for him to croak so they could get the scoop. And somebody came out of the house and said, Governor Houston would like to see you and you. And they thought, oh my word, he must want to make his peace with us. So they thought they would cooperate in the occasion and be very respectful. And they went in, and he was, um, his sickbed was in the lower front parlor of the steamboat house, and they went in. And Houston said, I want you to stand on my, at my right hand, and I want you to stand at my left hand. And they did so, thinking and, and waiting for his benediction. And Houston said, I have always wanted to die like Christ. <laughs> And now, at last, between two thieves, I can do it. <laughs> the names of these two uh, editors have, have been lost. Uh, I suspect one of them might have been Willard Richardson of the Galveston News, whom Houston had accused of being a thief um, once before. Uh, I find it peculiarly appropriate that uh, we're beginning our discussion of the personalities of San Jacinto with General Houston. Uh, not so much because he was the victor, either willingly or unwillingly, as we will discuss. But uh, surely no other Texas figure from the frontier era excited such a diversity of passionate feeling. You know, when he was alive, <coughs> a lot of times people would lose the merits of an issue. They wanted to know where, whether you stood with General Houston or against General Houston. You know, were you Houston or anti-Houston? That was how they framed the issues of the day. And I tell you what, I have found that that's 
<coughs> I'm sorry, still true now, that um, I began this book tour in Huntsville and did an autographing at the museum, and the local people would come up and they'd look at the book and they'd look at me and they'd say, do you talk bad about him in here? <laughs> I've had it with you history people talking bad about him. If you talk bad about him, I'm not interested. <laughs> the following week, I was in Corpus Christi at the State Historical Association's annual convention and the tenured professor types would come up and say, Sam Houston, that old SOB, can't believe you wrote a book to help him perpetuate this myth. I'm not gonna buy this book. And it struck me as so, so odd that that voltage he had 180 years ago is still with us, that um, it, it was the most extraordinary thing. Now, I know that many of you saw in the Houston Chronicle last Sunday on the, the front page of the Outlook uh, what one friend of mine has referred to as the uh, dueling editorials uh, between uh, myself and Dr. Stephen Harden of Victoria College, who will be following me on this uh, podium. Um, to the extent that some may have come here today sort of expecting a, a gunfight at the OK Symposium. <laughs> I hope you won't be too distressed to uh, learn that Steve Harden and I are good friends. You know, and there, there's a world of, of respect and amity uh, between us. And I, I have to tell you in all honesty that uh, we checked our firearms at the door, you know, <laughs> uh, albeit simultaneously. And uh, if you look over in the corner, you will see uh, General Houston's great-great-granddaughter, Nancy Burt, sitting between us to uh, keep us from tying each other's shoelaces together or something that we might do. But who was this Sam Houston? I mean, he, he had a whole life and a whole career before he ever came to Texas, and I think that will help us understand um, how he was regarded at the time he got here. Of course, he was uh, born in Virginia, 1793, uh, half-orphaned young. His mother took the brood to a family farm in eastern Tennessee. Um, to raise him. He was sort of a wild child. He hated school. He, he lasted in school less than a year. <coughs> uh, the family tried to put him at work on the family farm. He didn't like it. They put him to work in the family store. He didn't like it. Um, and his two older brothers, uh, James and John, who were uh, their mother's sort of enforcer, he called them the holy apostles. Um, he got tired enough of that. He ran away from home at 16 and lived with Cherokee Indians near the Hiwassee River. And uh, it's funny, I give workshops to, to history teachers saying, why do you have so much trouble getting people to identify uh, with history? Look at Sam Houston here. He had a terrible relationship with his family. He lived an active fantasy life. And how many teenagers walk around with their, their uh, sandals and swords, novels in their pockets? With Sam Houston, it was the Iliad. Ran away from home. And then like uh, many young, undirected young people, he joined the army when he was 20. Uh, fought under Andrew Jackson in the Creek Indian War, uh, grievously wounded, left um, for dead after the doctors decided they couldn't save him. And Andrew Jackson was always somewhat amused that Sam Houston refused to die on cue. Uh, fought with extreme valor, two musket balls in, in shoulder, arrow stick in the groin, and those wounds never completely healed, by the way. The day he died, uh, his valet said that he had had to change the bandages uh, even that morning because his wounds never healed. Uh, entered politics in Tennessee as a protege of Andrew Jackson, was the Nashville DA, quite young. Um, Two-term congressman from the 9th District, which included Nashville. And a lot of people have forgotten this about Sam Houston's early political career, that when he was in Congress in the mid-1820s, he met and became quite good friends with the Marquis de Lafayette, who came back to the United States for his triumphal tour. And he spent a lot of time with Lafayette. And there were two things that he learned from Lafayette that stayed with him and form sort of dual pillars of this political philosophy for the rest of his life. One was, you're going to have to do something with slavery. You know, the progress of the human condition is that it's a doomed institution, uh, but you need to end it in a way that is not going to bankrupt half your country. And that became, Sam Houston inculcated that into his political philosophy. The other half of what Lafayette said was, you must never let anything destroy the American Union, because if this American experiment in democracy fails, every tyrant in Europe will celebrate, and they can't wait for it. No matter what problems arise in your society, you must never break up the Union. And of course, as we all know, uh, Sam Houston sacrificed his own political career um, in that cause. Well, uh, two terms in Congress, he became governor of Tennessee. Um, in 1827, and a lot of people don't know this about him, that he was quite a liberal governor. He exercised the, the pardoning power um, quite a lot. And one of the things that always struck me was his foresight. As governor of Tennessee, here's a man who said, you know, we need to find a way to dig a channel around Muscle Shoals in the Tennessee River and so our farmers can have a way to float their produce down to market. Here's a guy who thought up the Tennessee Valley Authority 100 years before anybody else, you know. 
Um, as he was running for re-election uh, for a second term as governor, um, he married a woman named Eliza Allen, uh, thinking that this would be uh, the culmination of his grooming to be Andrew Jackson's sort of successor. With Andrew Jackson in the White House, to be governor of Tennessee and as popular as Houston was, was as close to being the Prince of Wales as our society can approach. Um, well, Eliza Allen left him after 10 weeks. And her family spent the next year vilifying him and talking about how much it was his fault and what a horrible man he was. He was ruined uh, politically and socially, went to Oklahoma, resigned his office, uh, removed to Oklahoma where his Cherokee um, adopted people had gone, and um, spent three years there alternately trying to reinvent himself and then just uh, despairing. And he was uh, long since an alcoholic by this time. In fact, when I was going through early papers that nobody had gone through before, one of the first ones I found was from the governor of Tennessee, Joseph McMinn, when Houston was a 25-year-old Indian agent. And McMinn would write him, nothing would make me sadder than to read an account of your having been on a spree. So even in, in his you know, late teens, early 20s, he still had quite a reputation with the bottle. In Oklahoma, and of course, the Cherokees could bend the elbow with the rest of them. Um, Houston made such a, a spectacle of himself uh, that they took away his honorary nickname, which was Colon the, the Raven, and gave him another one, which was Uti Tsiarde Taski, which means big drunk. Now, that wasn't just an insult. They also took away his Cherokee identity because that's an Osage name, which is another thing that has sort of dropped out of the history. That was the worst part of it. You could insult somebody and get away with it, but when you took away his identity, that was a big deal. So 1830, late 1831, he went back to Washington on uh, Cherokee business. And this was the time uh, that he began to talk with Andrew Jackson about Texas affairs. Some people think it began much earlier, but I haven't found any evidence of it. The reason I tell you all this is that Sam Houston already had a huge reputation, most of it not good, by the time he came to Texas. The, the religious people thought he was awful for being such a drunk and a wild man. Uh, for abandoning his wife. By the way, she left him. He didn't leave her, but that's not the story that the Allens put out for consumption. So by the time Sam Houston ever got to Texas and the revolution ever started, most of the political leaders here despised him just on the strength of his reputation. Now, uh, the, I think the first substantive thing we need to do is sort of arrive at some working definition of revisionism. And one of the things that I particularly appreciated about Dr. Hardin's editorial Sunday was his noticing that any work of history that alters the record is by definition revisionist. And he's absolutely correct. Any piece of work that is not completely derivative, and I won't say that never happens, um, it is by definition revisionist. But I don't think that that in the popular consciousness uh, is what people take it to mean. I think it has come to have a more colloquial uh, definition, which is sort of iconoclasm for its own sake and the assertion of, of ever more outlandish things about our history, sometimes with logically gymnastic documentation, for the sake of notice, fame, tenure, uh, whatever you're after at the moment. Now, I certainly would not say that any of our speakers here today produce such history, but I don't think any of us would deny either that a good deal of such history does get published. And um, I've been at work on a, a general Texas history for Simon & Schuster for a few years, and everywhere I go, I try and talk to the local museum curators, teachers, and so on. And of the many, many, many people who tell me that they're really tired of revisionist history. I think what they mean is the iconoclastic revisionism, not the more scholarly definition that Dr. Hardin uh, correctly provided. Now, uh, one of the, that leads us into Sam Houston and the sources of Sam Houston history. And let's, some amount of things have been made recently about whether sources can indeed be uh, poisoned. And you know, toxic sources, uh, are there such things? Well, everything should be considered, but in Houston's case, there are three or four whose authors were so eaten up with their hatred of Houston that I say, yes, they are too poisoned to use. Um, Coleman, Labadee, and a couple of others. You can use Anson Jones with caution, but he, he kind of skips around, you know, forward and backward. He would pull notes out of his um, uh, letterbox from time to time and add new things to them, and you never knew how sane he was at a particular moment. So you can use Anson Jones, but you have to be very careful. But the primary thing that you have to remember about Sam Houston is that he made not just enemies, but he made enemies who would dedicate themselves to his ruin. And there's only one or two people in a generation uh, that you can say that of. I mean, these guys would say anything, print anything to damage him. To that extent, he was the Bill Clinton of his generation. <laughs> Think about that. And I tell you, in 150 years, some writer and some historian is going to rediscover those interviews with Arkansas troopers state troopers and use them to prove, oh my God, Bill Clinton was a murderer. Just so, people are discovering you know, these furious Sam Houston things now that were written in his own time, 
and, and they lie there like, like jungle pits with, with bamboo stakes in the bottom of them. Um, consider, if you will, the example of this Mosley Baker pamphlet. Um, now, it's in the state archives, and in this pamphlet, Mosley Baker charges, um, among about 50 other pages of things, that uh, when Houston couldn't get the army to retreat with him from there, he was so despondent and got so drunk that um, he tried to kill himself and was only prevented from doing so by Jim Bowie. Well, now, really. Um, the history of that manuscript is that Baker wrote it in 1844 in vengeance for Houston's role in defeating Baker's bid for a Senate seat. And he wrote this screed, and it was, full, it, it was just so silly nobody would publish it. And Baker thought, well, okay, I tried. And he discarded the manuscript, and it stayed in his plantation, Evergreen. And when Asheville Smith bought the house, he found this manuscript, gave it to Baker's daughter, Fanny Darden, and eventually she gave it to the State Archives, where people have kind of chuckled over it ever since. But there it lies, and when somebody comes in from somewhere else to do research, they find this original manuscript by a guy who knew Houston with all this stuff in it, and as recently as Will Davis's Three Roads to the Alamo, there it is. Sam Houston tried to kill himself. You know, it also fooled no less a, a historian than E.C. Barker, who discovered and said, oh, my stars, look at all this, and published a, a thing about it in the quarterly. And then some numbers of, of issues later, uh, hats back on, gentlemen, an idiot, I was had. You know, and, and there it is, uh, still for, for people to, uh, to run into. So you have to be very careful. Now, mind you, I'm all for finding old documents. You know, the art of history is necessarily, to some degree, connecting the dots. And the accuracy of your history depends on a large degree of how many dots you have to work with. But my problem isn't finding the new source materials. My problem is what I think is some of the rather spectacular conclusions that these documents are sort of uh, contorted uh, to support. Consider, if you will, this famous W.W. Thompson affidavit of December 1840 in which he said that Houston, uh, when he told the, the provisional government that he was going to relieve the Alamo, dawdled on the Colorado for several days to everybody's disgust. Well now, <coughs> excuse me, why, what motive would somebody have uh, four years after the events to step forward and swear this out before a notary public? Well, we know that uh, Burnett and Lamar were in power and their people would buy a drink for anybody who'd step up and swear out some kind of calumny about saying Houston. So you start with a lot of caution about this document. Uh, and, but even if you accept what it says is true, and if Houston did, uh, and he says that Houston uh, said, well, I don't believe there's any Mexicans in the country, which is silly because Houston had predicted Sa uh, Santa Ana's arrival within a week's accuracy for months. Um, he was probably trying to allay any more panic from spreading uh, than he was. He wrote a number of letters saying, you know, we've got to do something to stop, you know, people from just stampeding out of the country. We've got to, to stop the panic. If he said this, I would suspect that that is what was on his mind. Can this statement be used to buttress an argument that, as it has been, that Houston stalled deliberately and let the Alamo fall deliberately so that that pesky Bowie and Travis, whom he was so jealous of, would be killed and out of the way, and then he would have all the glory to himself. I'm sorry, that conclusion requires a leap of logic that makes the second shooter on the grassy knoll seem like archived videotape. <laughs> now, mind you, objectivity is surprisingly easy to lose your grip on. It's a much more subtle thing than, than you might think. It's like the, the um, traffic cop with a radar gun. If his goal is to keep people driving in the speed limit, he's happy when they do. If his goal becomes filling his dollar quota by giving speeding tickets, he becomes angry and frustrated when people don't speed. And so he'll begin to push the envelope. Um, and I, he may not even know when he crosses that line. Even so, I think a lot of writers don't know when they leave off examining the history and letting it go where it will or begin cherry-picking facts to try and support some pet theory. I know from my own observation uh, that some of the more out there anti-Houston writers, when they have an opportunity to really let go at him, do so with a relish uh, that kind of undermines their, their objectivity. This really came home to me two nights ago. I was giving an after-dinner talk, um, which, by the way, I am almost always available to do for uh, an appropriate honorarium. <laughs> I bought cards. <laughs> Uh, but one of the more uh, ardent of the current Andy Houston buffs asked me this um, Tuesday night if I didn't think it would explain Eliza Allen's later hatred of Houston that he probably raped her on their wedding night. <laughs> now, I thought this was a remarkable proposition. Uh, not because it shed any light on that first marriage, which it did not, 
Uh, first, because it's contrary to everything we know about Houston's relationship with every other woman he was involved with. Secondly, because the Allen family spent the next year vilifying him with every name they could call him, and if he had brutalized Eliza, they certainly would have put that in the package. And thirdly, because Eliza herself, after Houston was safely president of Texas, tried to reconcile with him and take her chair as first lady, which if he had been a rapist, I doubt that she would have done. I found it remarkable because it made me wonder <coughs> if this is now a typical starting point these days for an inquiry into Sam Houston. It's one thing to examine the record and be able to accept negative information if that's where it takes you. Any responsible historian would do that. But it's quite another thing to stand there with a brush full of tar and look at him and wonder where he might need a little touch up. You know, and that line has been crossed rather often in the last 10 years. And sometimes with all the footnotage of formal scholarship uh, from these three or four really passionately anti-Houston tracts from, from that era. But back to that Thompson affidavit. Even if you dismiss it as spurious, you still have to explain why did it take Sam Houston five days to get from Washington on the Brazos to Gonzales during this critical time. I think it was because when the actual events of the breaking war overtook him, he had to accelerate plans for his uh, preparations for his master plan that had really been developing at least since the preceding August and probably much longer than that. Now, um, the, the theory that, that I think happened was that uh, Houston and Jackson had talked early in 1832. And Jackson told, him, told Houston that if you can draw a Mexican army into the neutral ground, you know, the, the Mexicans claimed the Sabine River as the, the border. Jackson administration claimed the Natchez without a lot of good reason. But Jackson said that he was prepared to defend the Natchez. And if they could get hostile forces into there, Jackson would, uh, would defend the Natchez and a, and a war would begin. Now, I thought maybe I was going a little bit out on a, a limb with this, and only after the book was finished did I, somebody point out to me, uh, in Anson Jones's diary, he mentions, uh, and he was in Washington uh, representing Texas early in the Republic era, that when John W. Houston told him that he was present when Andrew Jackson and Sam Houston discussed this arrangement. Well, now, I, I think Anson Jones got the W wrong. I, if, as I suspect, this was really John H. Houston, who was Houston's favorite cousin, Jack, who was his go-to guy in the Washington era, area, and he was intimate in Jackson's circle. I think it has the ring of authenticity. Houston also spent a lot of time in trouble trying to work an Indian angle into beginning the revolution. Uh, the United States and Mexico had signed an Amity Treaty in 1831 that they would keep each other's hostile Indians out of each other's territory. And uh, whether clever or deceptive, Sam Houston spent a lot of time trying to get uh, Creek Indians or other Indians from the Indian Territory to come down into Texas, very likely as a pretext to say, oh, hostile incursion, and get uh, the Americans to step in. Uh, this didn't quite work, but he tried it in two or three different configurations. So that when the war actually started, he had to send a lot of dispatches out to try and get this plan um, to hurry up, make sure there's an American army waiting for him in Louisiana. And he had one important ace up his sleeve, which was Samuel Price Carson, uh, had been a congressman from North Carolina before removing to Texas just in time to sign the Declaration of Independence. He was a workhorse in drafting the Constitution, and he almost became the ad interim president. Burnett defeated him by only six votes. Uh, Burnett made him provisional secretary of state, uh, I think not knowing that Carson and Houston had been friends for years. In fact, uh, Houston had uh, been talking to, to Sam Carson uh, ever since 1832 about uh, how things might work in Texas. So, you know, as, as the runaway scrape, oh, we'll just hurry things along, as the runaway scrape continued, just about the time that Houston had to make a decision, columns left or columns right, Nacogdoches or battle, he opened uh, a letter from Carson that was dated April 14th in which Carson said, I've got plenty of troops up here in the Redlands, keep luring him on. And I, I think that was uh, Houston's plan. And when he was supposedly dawdling on the Colorado, I think he was, you know, writing letters as fast as he could to his uh, subordinates to make sure that this, this happened. Now, moreover, the American commander of troops in Louisiana, uh, Edmund P. Gaines, Houston was also on the friendliest terms with him, and he had advanced troops forward to the Sabine on the pretext of Indian troubles around Nacogdoches. Now, Gaines had been moved to this act by a deputation of Nacogdoches citizens who were headed by Houston's best buddy in that area, who, were, who was Phil Sublette. You know, there's even a couple of contemporary sources that asserted that Gaines himself looked the other way as soldiers from his command shook their uniforms, crossed the river, and fought with the Texans. I don't think this happened on a large scale, uh, but there's pretty good evidence that it did happen on a small scale. And I'll tell you this, that when um, uh, Dr. Hardin's Texian Iliad uh, came out eight years ago, this documentation hadn't surfaced, but he called that, he, he said, this is speculation, but I think this may have happened, and he called it right on the money. 
Um, that's one of the, the really fine things about Texie and Iliad, which is, which is a, a good history, and you know, we don't agree on everything, but it's still a, a wonderful book. Um, that there is further evidence uh, that Houston, Carson, and Gaines were collaborating in preparing this sort of Piney Woods Waterloo for the Napoleon of the West. Um, Burnett had instructed Carson, after the war started, to go to the United States for aid and money and everything. Well, Carson didn't go to the, to, into the United States to, to meet the politicians. He went to western Louisiana to visit with General Gaines and make sure that there were enough volunteers and troops there ready to help Houston when he got there. And Gaines made uh, no secret himself of his sympathies. And he, in fact, he reported to the American Secretary of War that Jackson, quote, has been pleased to direct my immediate attention to the western frontier of the state of Louisiana in order to preserve, if necessary by force, the neutrality of the United States. Should I find any disposition on the part of the Mexicans or their red allies to menace our frontier, I cannot but deem it to be my duty to anticipate their lawless movements, and I love this, by crossing our supposed or imaginary national boundary and meeting them wherever they are to be found. To that end, he said, he had made arrangements uh, with, quote, the fine legionary brigade commanded by General Planche of the city of New Orleans. There were New Orleans volunteers coming uh, to help in this, in this effort. Uh, to the number of eight to 12,000 people. And when Carson wrote Houston, I've got plenty, I'm sure that he was talking about that eight to 12,000 volunteers. Now, there wasn't any conspiracy to keep President Burnett out of this loop. Uh, uh, Gaines communicated his intentions to Carson, and he passed them on to Burnett. Uh, now, the president at interim appears not to have received this letter uh, because he wrote Carson on May 23rd, I haven't heard from you, what have you been doing? Um, but Carson went on to say that it's only necessary to satisfy General Gaines of our situation, in which case he will cross the river and move upon the aggressors. Now, it's apparent from the wording of Carson's letter that the Indian threat was around Nacogdoches was perceived to be more than a pretext. But when he said that these, this red menace was supported by a 1,000 Mexican cavalry, no. No, he, they were trying to pull Americans into the fight. Well, Carson uh, wrote one letter back to Burnett that he did receive while Carson was on his way out of Texas. And this is during the height of the runaway scrape, and everybody was fleeing in panic. And he said, Houston has to be made to turn and fight somewhere. Ten days later, after meeting with Gaines, so certain was Carson of the plan's success, that was when he wrote Houston, my view is you should fall back, if necessary, to the Sabine. I am warranted in saying that volunteer troops will come on in numbers from the United States. You must fall back and hold out and let nothing goad or provoke you to a battle unless you can, without doubt, whip them. Moreover, Carson reported to Burnett that Gaines had sent a call for auxiliaries not just to Louisiana, but to Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee as well. And at least a portion of them uh, were going to be commanded by General Richard Dunlap, who was another one of Houston's best buddies from Tennessee days. When Houston was in exile in Oklahoma, the, the first letter of support saying, it's not so bad, cheer up, you know, you can get through this, um, that Houston received in Oklahoma was from Richard Dunlap. They had been best buddies ever since his, uh, Houston's days as Major General of the, of the Tennessee Militia. And Dunlap later explained to Carson, I joined the volunteers with a full conviction that we would not be detained long in the service of the United States, and in that event, I could take the whole volunteer corps with me into Texas. Now, there's another side to all this, which is that if any of General Gaines's men crossed into Texas to help in this cause, they would have come over on Gaines's Ferry, where the Camino Real reached the Sabine River, at which point perhaps three quarters of all the people who immigrated into Texas crossed the border. Now, the proprietor of Gaines Ferry was old James Gaines, who was born in 1776, and he'd been hauling back and forth in the Sabine for 17 years. He was the first alcalde in 1824 of the district of Sabine, and he was later postmaster, and he knew every path and trace through the woods. He was also a firebrand revolutionist, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and he had also helped draft the Texas Constitution, which brought him into very cordial contact with Samuel Price Carson. Now, Burnett did not timely receive all of Carson's letters, but Gaines did send him a letter on March 28th. That, and I've seen this letter, and if you had inked a chicken's feet and set it over a piece of paper, it is that illegible. Uh, but from what I can make out of it, uh, Gaines wrote, our good people have turned out liberally. Among them is my cousin E.P. Gaines, and the greater part of the arms and ammunition and horses is gone, but many more has fallen out to leave in a few days. Burnett must have been wondering, what in the world is going on out there? But clearer than his grammar and syntax was the fact that he was the first cousin on both his mother's and father's side of E.P. Gaines, whose army was right across the creek. Well, it turns out that Sam Houston, in making plans to meet Santa Ana on the Sabine, was not just being strategically prepared. 
he was being prudent because James Gaines was in possession of information that he considered reliable that the dictator planned to carry the war all the way to the border. And he sent a letter to Houston in which he said, <coughs> I called in Mrs. Dill. She, without interrogation, informed me that something is illegible. Jose Elias has told her that he conversed with St. Anna, and he told him he meant to march his army to Sabine and teach old Jackson to keep his people at home and make them behave themselves. Well, Gaines's Ferry was the most prominent crossing point, and, and I'm sure there's an important connection there. Now, you've been so kind with your attention, I'm going to pause here and give you a moment's recess. Uh, the Mrs. Dill uh, that James Gaines had talked to, most people don't realize this, but the Dill family was one of the most prominent in Nacogdoches. In fact, in 1986, I wrote a little photographic history of Texas for the sesquicentennial, and I used in it an old daguerreotype of Jane Long, uh, the so-called mother of Texas. You know that story, Kayamesha, Galveston Island, 1821. Well, this daguerreotype was about 20 years earlier than any others I'd seen. She still had dark hair and curls, and I thought, I'm going to use it. So I did, and told her a little story. And <clears throat> I was signing copies of this book at Trudy's Fireside Books in Tyler, and many people in the bookstore. And I looked up, and in the door of the bookstore, there suddenly appeared two large, very rural-looking farm-type women with shopping bags under their arms. And they came marching into the bookstore, and one of them pulled a gun on me. And sister woman spilled out her shopping bags onto the table where I had been autographing books, and people were going, she's got a gun. And well, they wanted me to understand in no uncertain terms by Cracky that Jane Long was not the mother of the first white baby born in Texas. It was really their great, 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 great grandmother, Helena Dill. And I looked through the family Bible and land deed records and court dockets and all these things that they brought, and they had a case. You know, they had an, a, a really good case. I said, well, why are you hiding out on your dairy farm outside of Nacogdoches nursing a beef? I said, tell somebody about this. And they said, oh, we got to run the farm, and you know, we got the cows to milk, and we can't worry about it. We just want to come up here and let you know you don't know it all. <laughs> and they left. I tell you, the history of Texas has not been written yet. <laughs> um, I'm going to hurry along here so you can ask some, some questions. Um, the greatest controversy about all this, of course, is whether when uh, the columns went right, or whether, and, instead of going left, whether Houston had given this order or whether he uh, was forced to go because that's where the men were going anyway. Um, there are contemporary sources that will tell you both ways. Um, my take on it is that uh, Carson had written Houston, don't fight him unless you're sure you can whip him. And what happened, Santa Ana very obligingly uh, separated himself from his main army and left himself supremely vulnerable for just a short period of time. But if Santa Ana had marched into East Texas with his full force. Houston still had that option to continue to lure him further on. And if such a fight had opened, it's not hard to imagine that a lot of Gaines's troops would have shucked their uniforms and helped out. Uh, the battle would have been in the middle of nowhere. Jackson would have exulted. Nobody would have known about it, at least for a while. And Texas would have wound up freeing itself from Mexico and joining the United States, perhaps in a single battle. You know, and that, I th think, was a possibility. Uh, but it's a card that Houston never had to play because Santa Ana uh, left himself in a, a place where uh, he would be beaten. Now, other people did suspect what was going on, and one of them uh, was, was Anson Jones. And in one of his lucid moments, he said that the retreat of General Houston to the country between the Sabine and the Natchez would have been considered an invasion of the territory of the United States by their president and by the tailor of that day, General E.P. Gaines. A conflict would have ensued between some of his troops and some of those of Santa Ana. <coughs> Excuse me. Blood would have been spilled upon disputed American ground, and war commenced by the act of Mexico uh, would have been then. General Jackson would have accomplished what Mr. Polk subsequently did. General Gaines would have been the second Cortez instead of General Scott, and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo would have been signed in 1838 instead of 1848. And at the end of the day, I, I think Anson Jones had it right on the money, uh, but at the end of the day, it was certainly remarkable how all, all those East Texas Indians who were such a threat you know, that drew the American army to the frontier. After San Jacinto was safely won, they weren't anywhere to be found. You know, they had just kind of melted back into the woods where I, I think they never actually um, materialized from. So did Sam Houston and Phil Sublette exaggerate the apparent Indian danger to provoke an American in intervention and then use Carson to make sure that American troops were in place and in time? Well, Houston's very first call from volunteers, the preceding audit, preceding August, he said, rally to me. You only need to serve under me until we can get reinforcements from General Gaines. This is in August of 1835. So that would suggest that this had been in his mind uh, all along. There's also secondary evidence that's not lacking about Houston following this, this plan. When the Secretary of War, Thomas Jefferson Rusk, joined the Army the first week in April, many of the soldiers believed that Rusk would at last compel Houston to turn and fight. Indeed, one of Rusk's missions 
was to, to deliver that famous letter from President Burnett, sir, the enemy are laughing you to scorn. And those soldiers uh, were dismayed when Rusk suddenly began approving of the course Houston had been taking. And moreover, Rusk became instrumental in keeping Burnett and Robert Potter and the other Houston ha haters in the government off his back. You know, some of the soldiers muttered aloud that Houston must have cast some Cherokee spell over Rusk to make him change his mind so much. Now, Rusk's valor at the Siege of Bear was unquestioned. What happened, I think, was that Houston took Rusk into his tent and revealed the plan to him. And it was a perfectly fine plan. And Rusk began to support him. I think this not just because of Rusk's sudden conversion, but because some of the smoking gun documents I found not in Houston papers, but in Rusk's papers at the, at the University of Texas. So these are the dots that I connected. And I thought, well, it makes sense to me, but maybe I'm going a little bit out on a limb here uh, in committing this to the biography, but I did. And as I said, you know, you publish the book and people come tell you more. Uh, well, I have since learned, you know, the Anson Jones and the John H. Houston story. Well, here's another one. I recently learned that another very gifted archives mole, Tom Lindley, uh, has been going through the Republic of Texas Army pension applications. And from at least two veterans, he's found pension applications saying they were couriers between Houston and EP Gaines. Here's a third. I was signing books in Fort Worth a couple of weeks ago and I met an 81-year-old descendant of one of the San Jacinto Camp Guard. And he said that his family story always was that the Camp Guard were on the lookout for Felicela to make sure that he didn't reinforce Santa Ana, and everybody knows that. We knew that. <coughs> but he said they were also on the lookout uh, for an American general who they thought might come down from Louisiana to help them. And here's a fourth. I learned only a couple of days ago that a, uh, another sleuth uh, in comparing the San Jacinto muster role with General Gaines's regimental role has found an incidence of name duplication that, uh, let us say, is much higher than a statistical John Smith incidence would lead one to expect. Uh, by the way, this is also an element that Dr. Hardin correctly anticipated in Texie and Iliad. When that book was published, he said, this is just speculation, but this may have been going on. And he, once again, he was right on the money. So in sum, on the issue of the Battle of San Jacinto and how it came to be fought, uh, we should, at, at some foreseeable time, have enough dots on the page to not just connect them but to really shade in some significant figures. You know, on the proposition that Houston did not retreat across Texas with the thought of, you know, San Jacinto, we will fight there. Um, of course, you know, that, that wasn't in his mind. Not because Houston was a coward and was afraid to fight, as his enemies have charged, but because he was in pursuit of his own plan. He had his own idea of what he was going to do. Now, the specific um, criticisms of Houston's generalship, I will leave those to uh, Steve to enumerate. But I will observe that, you know, in war as in politics, Houston was an ultimate pragmatist. You know, always play for time, always play for advantage until you can strike decisively. And in a, in a lengthy tactical retreat, you know, especially with the limited communication and intelligence of, of the 19th century frontier, you know, missteps surely were made. Um, and for lack of time, I'm, that's beyond me to go into detail on that right now. But I'm certain, you know, the shades of every general from Alcibiades to Eisenhower wish they had the benefit of our hindsight. To me, the last intriguing question of San Jacinto is, since Houston had Gaines waiting on the Sabine, why did he turn and fight at San Jacinto at all? You know, did he recognize Sam Houston is vulnerable, now I have to whip my men 55 miles in two and a half days, and then we'll do it? Or did he indeed finally perceive uh, that he was about to lose control? These men were just so angry and so full of fight that he couldn't control them much longer. Well, uh, that is sort of the, the big um, dividing era of, of what, what side you can come down on. I think it doesn't particularly matter because, as Louis Pasteur said, chance favors the prepared mind. And Houston had prepared these circumstances. And I think that the, the case is there that you can say that he had made his own luck. Now, when I say that the Texas history hasn't been written yet, that is not to say that, which I also believe, there are no new ideas anymore. And I had thought I kind of did a good piece of history in sort of piecing all this together. And uh, I got to the hotel yesterday and I checked in. And I, there was a letter waiting for me from a, a woman who says, sign me Lizzie. And she had seen the articles uh, in the Houston Chronicle last Sunday. Uh, and this is addressed both to Dr. Hardin and myself. And I'll show this to you when I'm, when I'm done. She said, dear sirs, I enjoyed both your articles on Sam Houston. And you both touched on the thing that governs people's attitudes toward him. When I moved here in, at age 10 in 1938, some of my friend's grandmothers were still bitter about what the Yankees had done to the South. But they were also of two minds about Sam Houston. He was a hero or a villain, depending on whether they approved of secession or not. Two of them said their families changed their minds about General Sam after he opposed secession. Then talking about the revolution, she says, but what we were taught was 
that Sam Houston was headed for the border of the United States so he could get help in fighting the Mexicans. The opportunity at San Jacinto was considered to be a godsend. And I thought, wait a minute, why did I go to all this trouble when uh, Lizzie <laughs> knew this all along? <laughs> so I will thank, you know, uh, I will end with a story. One of the first things I learned about Texas history, especially when you talk about Sam Houston in East Texas, is that you assume the submissive posture. Six years ago in May, I went to a symposium in Huntsville. And they imported some very reputable scholar, I think he was from Duke, um, to talk about Sam Houston and his Mexican protectorate idea of the late 1850s. And he's speaking at the museum, and the audience is mavens and housewives and locals, you know, easy audience. And he gives this lecture on Sam Houston and his foreign policy. And I, I thought he said a couple of things that were kind of stinky, but I wasn't going to say anything. And he was just so tenured and so confident and so academic. And he had some time left. Yes, I can take some questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what would you like to ask? And it happened to be one of the local mavens who had arrived with her own shopping bags. And she said, now, if what you say is true, then what about those le that letter that General Houston wrote of March the 8th of 1859, in which he said, and you could see it in his eyes, mayday, mayday, I'm going down. <laughs> they ate him alive. So um, if we have a couple of minutes, I will take a couple of questions. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. Very good. Do I stay here to answer, or do I just, just go on? Okay. Um, I'd, I'd actually like to uh, ask you the first question. Okay. Uh, I think it is, uh, there are many accounts that indicate that during the San Jacinto campaign, there was a lot of dissatisfaction among the rank and file with Sam Houston. Uh, but when you see the result of the battle, you see the euphoria of a victory, and you see the establishment of a government, uh, almost immediately thereafter, there are accounts coming out very negative and critical of Sam Houston and, his, and what was happening during that San Jacinto campaign. This tended to dog him for almost the rest of his life. You find these in the elections of 1841, when he was running for Senate, when he was running for governor. Uh, even, uh, even his friends were uh, involved in, when Labadee's account was published in 1859, um, uh, there was a lawsuit for libel, and, uh, and it was six days after, governor, after Houston became governor, he was having his deposition taken and trying to recount again his conduct during the San Jacinto campaign. How do you explain this? How do we account for the fact, other than politics, can we just, can we, do, we, do we lay it all on politics that this negative reaction was so strong and so persistent throughout the rest of his life? How do we explain that? I think it, it, partly it was politics because uh, many of the people in the Army later had their own political aspirations. And since they couldn't be Houston protégés, they had to attack him. I also think that the Army at that time uh, there, at the end of the campaign, a lot of people found themselves on the outside of all this glory looking in. One of them was James Hazard Perry, uh, who had been sent as an aide de camp. And it's, a, it's as old as war, that if the government doesn't like the general, they will send a spy to be his aide de camp. And that was exactly what Hazard Perry had, had done. Houston saw through him, uh, made sure that he couldn't be effective, and Hazard Perry took to the lecture stump for the rest of his life. Uh, talking about how Houston was a coward and never meant to fight. And indeed, the uh, Robert Coleman, a farmer in the Army, uh, was written largely to take up the cudgels for Hazard Perry. Uh, so there was a certain disaffected core of people in the Army uh, who then you know, made this sort of cottage industry um, out, of, out of defaming him. But it was politics, and it was partly, partly personal, because Houston had a very high um, voltage to his personality that uh, if you didn't like him, by golly, you didn't like him in the worst way.